because this is a 15 year old, normal weight, healthy child. Whoa, what? Bro, you literally posted the chart. Their weight is considered a risk factor and they're not healthy. They've already been hospitalized for asthma. How are you gonna sit here live when you showed us the pictures? Wait, what the? It hasn't probably uh, been done because the, the government doesn't want to show that the darn vaccine is full of, is full of shit. Tell us about who this person is. Dr. Gonzalez is one of our emergency room doctors at Phoenix Indian Medical Center. And she's a fellow. Okay, we got an ER doctor who is not a researcher giving her opinion on things. All right, hard hitting O'Keefe journalism. Let's go. Employee? Correct. And now you got this guy in room four who got his second dose of vaccine mm -hmm. um, on Tuesday, has been short of breath. And he's got bone myocarditis. Yes. All this is bullshit. I, and and now, now let's see. Probably myocarditis due to the vaccine. Right. But now they're not going to blame the vaccine. Well, and you know what? But he has an obligation to report that, doesn't he? They are not reporting. Right. Because they want to shove it under the... Yeah. Under the, the... How do we square that they're not reporting anything with the fact that the VAERS shit has like had more reports than for any other vaccine in human history? How do you have both of those? Like, I'm pretty sure there's tons of shit that has been reported on VAERS. Um, now, whether we want to say those reports are good or bad or not, but wh how, what are we hiding? Uh, the the map. What patient was she referring to? She was uh, referring to that patient that 30-something-year-old patient that had congestive heart failure. Congestive failure. heart failure. And in that particular patient's case, it was not reported. No. Wow. The problem in here is they are not doing the studies. People that had it, you right. know, and the people that have been uh, uh, vaccinated, they're not doing any um, antibody testing. It's super fishy. It's not that it hasn't been done. It hasn't been published. <laughs> That's it hasn't wrong. probably uh, been done because the, the government doesn't want to show that the darn vaccine is full, of, is full of shit. The government doesn't want to show that the vaccine is full of shit. It's not doing what it, its purpose was. May I see your badges? You're Jody <laughs> O'Malley, the Department of Health. I like the dramatic music in the background. Um, fuck. This video is gonna end up sucking because there's not even gonna be anything I can really respond to. It's just gonna be like some lady on camera making a bunch of claims that like, okay, like did anybody follow up with the hospital? Was there any like actual like third party independent research done to see if anything's with the case or, or is it just like you just have one person on camera just like saying a bunch of random shit that we can't actually talk about? In human or, or we can't like verify or not, like none of this is falsifiable. This, this is the United States government identification. I'm looking at the CDC website. It says that you're required to report adverse events following vaccinations. One of those would be uh, congestive heart failure. Yeah, it's a huge one. Were there other instances that they, they didn't report? Oh, I've seen dozens of people come in with uh, adverse reactions. Dozens. That's yeah, really sad. She had just come back from surgery from leave. So what are we looking at here? You're looking at me. Transferring her um, to uh, a higher level of care that could handle her condition. And this is a, col a colleague at your hospital who got sick. She didn't want to take it because of her religious beliefs. And she was coerced into taking it. Why? <laughs> Sorry. Why are you choosing to blow the whistle? It's not. What a lot of people would do, they're scared, they're afraid. Are you afraid? I wouldn't necessarily say I'm afraid because my faith lies in God and not man. This is evil at the, the highest level. You have the FDA. Oh shit. I'm trying not to use like background information for Project Veritas because I know that O'Keefe and Veritas is like a, it's like a scumbag or but I'm trying not to use like background like meta shit. But um, I will say like one meta thing. They do this with everybody that they bring on where they, um, where they have them give their story, but then they'll also set up these like GoFundMes for them. They've done this over and over again for people. Was it ever verified whether or not they took a cut from any of this money? So this person has raised over $400,000. It's funny because people always say like, oh, pharmaceuticals, they're incentivized to lie to you. You don't think this person might be a little bit incentivized? Like over $400,000 per cut? Like why don't you, why doesn't, I like it when conspiracy theorists never think like, well, maybe there's incentives in the alternative media as well. Like they never actually think that, you know, but. 
You have the CDC that are both supposed to be protecting us. Are you afraid they're gonna retaliate against you? Yeah. I'm a federal employee. What other federal employees do you see coming out? But you put your faith in God. Amen. The government doesn't want to show that the darn vaccine is full of shit. I <laughs> like how they keep playing. Is this like the fourth time we've heard this clip? The reason you're not sure the people who are vaccinated, that's sounding very germane. I'm gonna go through it more instead of one. Don't get the vaccine. She didn't want to take it because of her religious beliefs. She was coerced into taking it. They are not reporting because they want to show it on the, the map. Why are you choosing to blow the whistle? Are you afraid? I wouldn't necessarily say I'm afraid. My faith lies in God and not man. Jesus Christ. My name is Jody O'Malley, and I'm a master's prepared registered nurse. Well, first of all, your hospital is run by HHS, correct? I work for Health and Human Services um, with a Indian Health Services branch for the Native Americans. You, you, these are federal employees. Yes. I work for the government. Oh, <laughs> No offense, okay, and I don't mean any offense, but like federal employees, is that supposed to be like a, you, this is the cream of the crop, the best in the world? Like, it just means you work for the, for the state or you work for the government. That's, like. Was that supposed to be like really flashy? Like federal employees? Like. Oh, I mean, the, the main thing is we have to follow. I know. I mean, that's another the thing. I don't know how much longer I'll be here. And the <laughs> here. Yeah. I know. Are the policies and administrators coming directly from the federal government? Yes. The problem in here is they are not doing the studies. People that had it, you right. know, and the people that have been. Uh, uh, vaccinated. They're not doing any um, antibody testing. Now you got this. What does that What does that mean when she says it? They're not doing any antibody testing. Is this supposed to play on the ADE fears, or is she saying? I, I don't understand what she means when she says that. Are we just? I wonder if they're going to talk about any of the claims that she's making. Also, what do you mean when you say there are no studies? Like the the, the vaccines are rigorously studied. It's part of like what's being published because of like the in order to qualify the, for the emergency use authorization for the FDA. Like everybody around the world can look at these studies. They're not like mysterious. I don't understand what they mean. It's not, um, it's not, it's not studied. What does that mean? It's not studied. Like the, the entire world is studying the uh, middle term, I guess you'd say, or long term effects of these vaccines. The entire world. How are you saying it's not being studied? Guy in room four who got his second dose of vaccine mm -hmm. um, on Tuesday has been short of breath. Okay, now his BNP is elevated, D-dimer elevated, ALT, oh. all his liver enzymes are elevated, his PT, PTINR is He's elevated. He's got myocarditis. Yes! Oh, this is bullshit. I, and then no, let's see. It's probably myocarditis due to the vaccine. Right. But now they're not going to blame the vaccine. Well, and you know what? But he has an obligation to report that, doesn't he? Oh. Is Veritas always just the absolute lowest tier bait? Uh, I usually feel like, I feel like it usually shot to have arguments that are still shit, but a bit more refined than the slow hanging Um Veritas is always garbage, yeah. I was just curious to watch this because like, I'm, I'm more familiar on this than most of the other shit that they cover, so. Um, but yeah, nothing good usually comes from this organization. It happened, right, what is it? 60 days after, if you see anything? Uh, they have got to. But how many people report. are reporting? They are not reporting. Right. Because they want to show it under the... Yeah under the, 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 the map. In this instance with Dr. Gonzalez, what patient was she referring to or without saying she the She was uh, referring to that patient that had congestive heart congestive failure. Congestive heart failure. And yeah. in that particular patient's case, it was not reported. No. I'm gonna have to transfer you to another hospital. Okay. We don't have cardiologists here. And what you're developing is like a congestive heart failure, mm -hmm. okay? And, and that's not good. I don't know where this is coming from. Mm -hmm. On July 29th, you have... <laughs> I'm, I've been to the doctor a few times. <laughs> this, I, I don't want to generalize. Never mind. This doesn't sound like any, any hospital visit I've ever had in my life. But, may, but maybe some are like this. I don't know. I can't generalize. I, I truly do mean that. I can't generalize to every hospital experience. Uh, maybe other doctors are, are different or whatever. Uh, yeah, I'll just say that. But <clears throat> had the first COVID vaccine, mm. and August nineteenth, you had the second. You know, you don't have COVID. 
okay? But you have got a lot of symptoms, you know, and you're developing congestive heart failure. Were there other instances that they they didn't report? Oh, I've seen dozens of people come in with an adverse reaction. Was one of the ones you saw a 15 year old with blood clots? I wish I had the medical knowledge. Um, like, is congestive heart failure something that you can just diagnose? Does that present with symptoms that you can just diagnose that without like a machine? Like, do you have to do like x-rays or CT scans to find out if like the heart is filling with, like how, fuck, do I have any physicians in chat? I'm so curious about this. I wonder if you can just say like, oh, you're developing congestive heart failure without, without actually doing any type of test. Destiny is very clinical. BNP is a good measure of congestive heart failure. Okay, so maybe you can do this without like a complicated machine. I don't know what BNP looks like, hold on. You probably need to do an EKG. Oh, this is looking for I don't think I can pronounce this. Hold on. BNP, blood. Does this test have other names? B-type, um, nat natriuretic, natriuretic, peptide. Um, this test looks for the hormone BNP in your blood. BNP stands for brain or B-type, natriuretic peptide. It's made inside the pumping chambers of your heart when pressure builds up from heart failure. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, so I was um, just covering a nurse. Wait, so this is what I was checking. Hold on. So um, the lady said that they had to move the patient to another hospital because they have a cardiologist. They didn't have a cardiologist, but they diagnosed him with heart failure. So it sounds like there are blood tests and maybe an EKG you can do to, to confirm that you have this type of condition, but then you would have to transfer them to a, a hospital, somebody more qualified to get around. That seems like it's possible. I was just making sure. Nurse. Um, he's in here with bilateral PEs, but he's fine. And I'm like, okay. So he wasn't on oxygen or anything like that. And I said, was he um, vaccinated? And then she's like, I don't know. So then I looked in the chart and he was. He had the Pfizer vaccine or at the end of July and he was due for a second dose. So this is- Hold on, I wanna read this chart actually. Let's just read this real quick. Had the Pfizer vaccine. Patient is a 15 year old male with a history of asthma, presents to emergency department for shortness of breath, two time or X two days, is that over two days? Which became worse yesterday evening. Patient also has two days of urinary symptoms, myalgias, myal myalgias, malaise, um, rhinorrhea, non-productive cough, intermittent episodes of nausea, and one episode of emesis. I can't pronounce half this shit. Otherwise tolerating oral intake, no abdominal pain or changes in bowel or bladder function. States that he had a friend who he thinks had strep throat. Patient had first dose Pfizer COVID immunization end of July and is due for second dose tomorrow. Patient has been hospitalized for asthma in the past. Last time he was on oral steroids was last year. No history of intubation for asthma. Wait, so he's been hospitalized for asthma in my, uh, my algus. Is that it? Sorry. So he's been hospitalized for asthma in the past. It says past medical history has chronic problems. Hospitalized at Phoenix Children's for asthma um, exacerbation and pneumonia and pneumonia too. Is this, does this indicate, I don't know what these numbers mean. Is this like three separate hospitalizations or one or two or I can't, I don't know how to read this down here. So it sounds like this is guy, it sounds like he's got like some pretty big problems already, <laughs> um, but okay. Jesus, leaking this info can't be legal. Um, I'm pretty sure this is a HIPAA violation, but I don't know if there are special protections for journalists. The heart inflammation thing is an actual side effect. Yes, the vaccine can lead to a little bit of myocarditis, which I think is a fancy way of just saying um, parts of the heart can get inflamed, but it's not like this is not a chronic condition. Um, it's usually, um, I think acute is the opposite. You have like a little bit of myocarditis, but then it clears up after like, I think it's generally within a few days, it generally clears up. Um, it's not like you have myocarditis. It's not, it's a scary word, but like you can have a little bit of inflammation and then you'll be okay in a few days. Like it's generally an acute thing. See, or at the end of July and he was due for his- Hold on, so this guy in Twitch chat, so this is like a good example of falling for this type of misinformation. This is why Project of, uh, Veritas works. So this guy in Twitch chat, Banangram or whatever, a little bit of, can you sound more ridiculous? So if you use like the medical terminology for some things, it can sound really scary, right? Like, oh my God, you have fucking myocarditis. The fucking blood vessels of your heart are fucking inflamed, right? 
but there's a lot of different things that can cause inflammation of vessels in the heart. Um, or there's a lot of things that can cause inflammation in general. Fucking sugar can cause inflammation in general. Um, but we're looking at like, is this an acute problem, something that happens and then clears up a little bit? Or is this like a chronic problem that's being caused, like long-term effects, that's really, really, really bad. Um, yeah, but just like, just saying that like, oh my God, inflammation is not like, uh, you're fucked, you know? Uh, also like, the fact that this person has literally been hospitalized, it looks like multiple times in the past for an asthma attack. Um, and he had a friend who he thinks had strep throat. Like, yeah, I don't know. It's funny that you would blame this on the vaccine, but okay. Destiny, why are hospitals being told not to report it? I, I don't know. I've never heard that before. There's this one lady making this claim. I don't know if that's true or not. I would need like more information about that. The second dose. So this is essentially. Only just read this, so I don't know how true this is, but it seems that they can't find this doctor on the Arizona registry for doctors. There is no physician licensed in Arizona by that name. Maybe they used a different name. Maybe she's licensed in a different state. I'm trying to be very, very charitable. Two to three weeks later. Most likely. And he so. was due for a second dose. So this is essentially two to three weeks later. Most likely cause of hypoxia, unusual PE at this age. Unclear etiology. They don't know how, why he got it. So how do we know that the blood clots, or how do you know? Etiology. They don't know how. Okay. <clears throat> Bilateral PNA and URI, URI symptoms, small bibacillar uh, infiltrates on CT that do not explain hypoxia. Um, COVID-19, RSV, and influenza negative times two in differential, another viral infection, bacterial. Uh, bilateral segmental PE, most likely cause of hypoxia, unusual PE at this age. Um, what? Hold on, I need to look some of this up because I don't know what these stand for. <clears throat> she said she was a registered nurse. No, I don't think they were looking up this lady. I think they were looking up the other person. PE is pulmonary embolism. Is that really what it stands for? Okay, so they have a pulmonary embolism. PE equals physical education. Okay, geez, okay. Trying to figure out what bilateral segmental. I, I can guess bilateral means obstructing two things. Segmental means a segment, two segment. I don't I don't know what this means. We need a doc we need an on-call doctor for this shit. Destin, here she is a doctor in Arizona. Oh, okay, somebody did find the registry for the one lady. Small segmental or subsegmental PE are of importance in patients with limited cardiopulmonary reserve and for diagnosis of chronic pulmonary hypertension. They may be an indicator of silent deep venous thrombosis, which may predispose patients to more severe embolic events. Is a pulmonary embolism ordinarily a bad thing? Oh, a bilateral segmental PE means both vessels to the lungs are at least partially blocked. Gotcha. If you have a if you have a pulmonary embolism though, does it mean that it doesn't necessarily completely block everything off? Because I mean, if this kid has a pulmonary embolism that's blocking off like both sections of the bronchial, is that what you said? Like, but he's not dead, obviously, right? So can is it a can it be a can a pulmonary embolism be a partial obstruction? That's my physician question. It won't always. Okay, so you can have so a pulmonary embolism a pulmonary embolism can lead to a partial obstruction. Okay, that's I'm just trying to understand when I when I read this. Um, hypoxia um, just means that you have low, um, I think, oxygen levels in your blood. So if you use like a pulse oximeter or whatever, that your numbers are lower than 95, I think, or 96 is considered hypoxia. I don't know what the official number, but it's low. And usually be an unclear etiology. So unclear etiology means that they don't know what's causing it. And then now they list the risk factors. So the subject sounds like they're overweight. Um, and then a possible genetic component, no recent COVID-19 infections. They received their vaccine first shot about three weeks ago. And then they have asthma as well. I think asthma gives you an elevated risk for blood clots. Does pul is pulmonary embolism, that counts as a type of blood clot, right? But, okay, sorry, all right, just to be, hold on. Let me be very, very, very clear when I say something when I'm reading through this, okay? I'm just reading through the chart to understand it. I'm not pretending to be able to make a diagnosis here or like, oh, well, I read this and I understand the term, so this is what's going on. I don't, maybe some doctors can do that. I don't know if you can do that with just looking at these things. I'm just curious so that I can understand what I'm reading. I will say though that by reading this, I will say very confidently, and I will say this, and if any doctor wants to call me out, feel free to send me an email. I don't think you can just read this and go, oh, it was definitely caused by the vaccine. I, there, I think you need more information to say that. And it seems like this particular patient has other risk factors as well. Having somebody with asthma that has been hospitalized with their asthma is already pretty rare. I don't believe, actually, let's check that real quick. Um, percentage of asthmatic individuals, or percentage of asthmatic hospitalized. Do most people with asthma get hospitalized with it? I wonder what the percentage is. For years, researchers estimated the prevalence of severe asthma to be five to 10% of all asthma patients. 
This guy's been hospitalized multiple times for asthma. Sounds like he's overweight and he's 15. Like, so there's a lot of risk factors here for things that could lead to a pulmonary asthma, embolism, but okay. <clears throat> okay, but anyway, let's go. Yeah, unusual PE at this age. Unclear etiology. They don't know why he got it. So how do I we don't, now I know that this is like O'Keefe 101, but it's a little bit irritating that they keep talking about how unclear, like we don't know what's causing it. Because have they brought up a single time that this kid had asthma? Did they say that at all? Does anybody remember? Or I can go back and look. Like, have they mentioned at all that this kid had asthma and he was fucking hospitalized in the past for it? Because that's like a pretty big thing, you know? Destiny, acute means extreme or bad, not little or negligible. Wait, what? My understanding is that acute just means short-lasting. Acute doesn't say whether or not it's good or bad or negligible. I thought acute just means, like, short. Like, it doesn't last long. Um, and then, so you have, like, acute symptoms and you've got chronic symptoms. So, for instance, SARS-CoV-2... The SARS thing stands for, oh my God, what was it? Um, it's something acute respiratory uh, syndrome. So what does the S stand for? Sudden? Is it sudden acute respiratory syndrome? Severe acute, oh, it's severe acute respiratory syndrome. I don't know why I forgot that. Um, so the S is for severe. Acute is because it's short lasting. Respiratory system is because it targets the lungs, right? Okay. Acute can mean intensive. Uh, maybe it can in other things, sure, but like, I, I, I don't know. Anytime I've seen like acute, uh, like usually acute means not short, it means short lasting and then chronic means long lasting. All right, sorry. I know that the blood clots or how do you know that the blood clots? Destiny, these people are dumb. Why use severe if acute already means it's severe? Oh yeah, sure. Okay, sorry, stop. Okay, going back. Fuck. Or why he got it. So how do we know that the blood clots or how do you know that the blood clots are a result of the COVID vaccine? Because this is a 15 year old, normal weight, healthy child. Whoa, what? Bro, you literally posted the fucking chart. Their weight is considered a risk factor and they're not healthy. They've already been hospitalized for fucking asthma. How are you gonna sit here live when you showed us the fucking pictures? Wait, what the fuck? <laughs> Okay, this is Project Veritas 101, all right. No reason for him to have a blood clot. It's a shame they're not treating people. I know, like they're supposed to, like they should, and it, I think they won't take it back. And how many have you seen that have gotten vaccinated here? The that have, sick and yeah. side effects? A lot. A lot. Have you seen it too? Yeah. Yes. So and I'm like, who's, who's writing part? the VAERS report? Nobody, because it takes over a half an hour to write the damn Why? The CDC website, it says that you're required to report adverse events following vaccinations. Is there a policy at the hospital for reporting these complications? No. There has never been any directive sent out on reporting. With what? Like, so you're a journalist, O'Keefe. Why not email the hospital and ask? Get a response. Did, they, did you contact them for a clarification? Like, hey, do you guys have a product? Did you contact any other doctors that work there, right? These are things that like a journalist would do, right? So if you have somebody that comes and tells you something, one of the most important parts of being a journalist is fact checking. Like, oh, I'm getting this report for this one person. Well, let me go talk to their colleagues. Is it the same thing? Let me go talk to who they work for. Is it the same thing? You know, let me go talk to neighboring institutions. Have you heard these types of complaints before? This is what you do as a journalist. This is why when Project Veritas tried to get a woman to fake a report to the Washington Post about being um, raped by, um, it wasn't Donald Trump, it was, um, oh God. It was the guy that um, Bannon and Trump tried to push in, was it, Roy, it wasn't, was it Roy Moore? It might've been Roy Moore, yeah. When, um, when they tried to plant that story in WAPO, when they did their uh, like peripheral investigation, they found out the lady's story was bullshit because this is what journalists do. You're supposed to do a lot of peripheral investigation. O'Keefe does none of this because he doesn't give a fuck if the story is true or not. He just wants hits on fucking YouTube. For many GOP voters, even ones who saw merit to the Roy Moore allegations, policy was the strongest motivating reason to vote, and so many were willing to begrudgingly do so for Roy Moore regardless of the credibility of what was being said about him. However, the GOP party still had a problem with floating Alabama voters who might well be put off at Roy Moore's alleged history of misconduct, and there was no clear way out of this particular quandary. Apart from, if the newspaper reporting the sexual assault allegations, i.e. the Washington Post, could be discredited. Beth Reinhardt was one of the journalists at the Washington Post who wrote the Roy Moore story, and literally hours after she published her article, she received an email from an anonymous source with the subject line, Roy Moore in AL. The email said, Roy Moore in Alabama. 
I might know something, but I need to keep myself safe. How do we do this? Beth wrote an email back asking if the person would be willing to talk off the record. The reply she got back was, Not sure if I trust the phone. Can we just stick to email? And then in a subsequent message, the source wrote, I need to be confident that you can protect me before I will tell all. I have stuff I've been hiding for a long time, but maybe it should stay that way. Jamie was a middle-aged woman, long red hair, nicely dressed. She opens up about her childhood and says she was abused as a child. She'd moved around a lot and had ended up living with her aunt in the Talladega area of Alabama, where she attended a church youth group. It was here that she first came into contact with Roy Moore, who was 45 years old. Jamie was only 15 years old. Roy Moore, the 45-year-old man, initiated a secret sexual relationship with Jamie. Even more disturbingly, she fell pregnant as a result, and she wanted to keep the baby. But Roy Moore talked her into having an abortion and drove her all the way to Mississippi to get one. Jamie said she'd kept silent about her sexual abuse all these years, but started thinking about it again when the Washington Post published their story about Roy Moore's accusers. It was at this point that the conversation took a bit of a strange turn. Jamie said to Beth that she was disgusted with President Trump for endorsing Roy Moore and asked whether Beth could guarantee her that she could make Roy Moore lose the election by coming forward with her story. This seemed strange to Beth as when sexual abuse victims came forward, they were rarely motivated by specific strategic outcomes. It's more typically that they felt their stories needed to be heard, regardless of what happened in the aftermath. Multiple times, Jamie hammered on this point that she needed a verbal guarantee of Roy Moore's campaign being destroyed, and Beth advised her in a subsequent text message that she could not predict what the impact of Jamie coming forward would be. It was up to Jamie to decide whether or not she wanted to come forward. Jamie then became angry when Beth asked her for documents which could corroborate her story. I feel anxiety and negative energy after our meeting. You just didn't convince me that I should come forward. In response to Jamie, Beth said, I'm so sorry, but I want to be straight with you about the fact-checking process and the fact that we can't guarantee what will happen as a result of another story. And Jamie responded back, I'd rather go to another paper than talk to you again. It looked like Beth wouldn't be getting this story after all. But there was something about Jamie that had seemed very off. Beth started looking into the details of Jamie's story, and bit by bit, she started uncovering things that didn't add up. Jamie had a Twitter page with the profile picture, Love Not Hate Makes America Great, and a Facebook account with the banner photo of John F. Kennedy. But both accounts had only been created in the last six months. Beth's fact-checking of Jamie's story led to some more interesting findings. Jamie said she lived in New York, but the phone number she provided had an Alabama area code. Jamie also claimed that she worked at NFM Lending, but when Beth called that company up, they said they didn't have an office in Westchester County and nobody named Jamie Phillips worked there. However, the real red flag was uncovered by another reporter at the Washington Post called Alice Kreitz, who came across a GoFundMe page which had been created by someone called Jamie Phillips. I'm moving to New York. I've accepted a job to work in the conservative media movement to combat the lies and deceit of the liberal MSM. I'll be using my skills as a researcher and fact checker to help our movement. I was laid off from my mortgage job a few months ago and came across the opportunity to change my career path. The timing of being laid off and then being presented with the chance to finally do some good in this world all came together at just the right moment. Because of my recent layoff, however, I am in need of funding and sponsorship for me to be able to make this big life change. The real Jamie Phillips was a woman devoted to Donald Trump. She owned a Twitter account with the handle Jamie Loves President Trump and a fawning photo tribute to the president in her profile banner. She posted about things like fake news at CNN, she interacted with quite a few of Trump's media lapdogs, and she posted mocking videos of the Women's March in Washington, D.C. In the following days, a Washington Post reporter would station themselves in a car park at Westchester County and observe Jamie Phillips walking straight through the front door of Project Veritas headquarters. Veritas is in the process of hiring 12 more undercover reporters, recruiting at projectveritas.com. If you're listening to this broadcast and you want to do what we do, I will pay you to go undercover. Jamie had been paid by James O'Keefe to lie that Roy Moore sexually abused her as a child, lie that Roy Moore impregnated her, and lie that Roy Moore had forced her to get an abortion. 
The whole thing was a complete fabrication. The reason why Jamie had been repeatedly asking Beth to guarantee her verbally that Roy Moore would lose the election was because Jamie was wearing a hidden camera, recording the meeting, and following the Project Veritas script so she could get useful sound bites for James. After engineering this conversation, James O'Keefe's plan was to use the sound bites to discredit the Washington Post and the women who Roy Moore had allegedly abused when they were as young as 14 in order to give Republicans the fuel they needed to decry all allegations as fake and get Roy Moore elected. Not realizing that the Washington Post had rumbled her, Jamie arranged a follow-up meeting with another reporter called Stephanie McCrumman. Stephanie recorded the entirety of the conversation on audio. Hi, are you Jamie? <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see you too. So Stephanie walks in and Jamie is already there waiting for her. Yeah. Stephanie purposefully puts her bag down right next to Jamie's, obscuring the view of any hidden cameras Jamie might have. But then Jamie instantly moves her bag out the way. So it's obvious she's recording Stephanie using a hidden camera in her bag. Now Beth has told me a little bit about your conversations uh, okay. and your, uh, you know, texting back and forth. Yeah. But um, but I thought it was probably best just you know to sort of you know I want to hear your story and yeah. just you know start from the beginning. Yeah. Um, I I mean I did tell her like the outline and like just the general like I told her stuff about my life like growing up and it was almost like. She, it felt like she just like didn't care at all. So I don't know. I just felt really weird about it, mm -hmm. and I'm just not sure. I mean, maybe it's not the right fit with the Washington Post. I don't mm -hmm. know. Well, um, you know, like I said, Beth told me a little bit about what you talked about. So if you want to just, you know, I'm here to listen. So. Well, I really don't like today I mean maybe like the next time we meet we can like hash it out some more but I mean really today I wanted to really hear more from you in particular yeah. like about like where you see the story going and what kind of an impact and things like that yeah so just to because I just don't feel like I just don't feel convinced yet that it's even the right thing for me to do. Right. Notice the way that Jamie's trying to apply pressure to Stephanie here, much like a negotiator closing a sale. Jamie has something the Washington Post wants, her sexual abuse story, and Jamie's threatening to take it elsewhere if she doesn't get the verbal reassurance she needs. Mm -hmm. In this next bit of audio, she's going to criticize Beth, the reporter who tried to fact check her, and this is to preemptively deter Stephanie from doing the same thing. Um, so she was telling me a lot about like the process and the, the background and the fact checking mm -hmm. and that stuff's not really like that doesn't even really bother me like that's not even really a concern to me mm -hmm. my biggest concern is like coming forward for no reason and having my name published mm -hmm. and then having it be for no reason mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so well um you know it's really it's 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 your decision I mean, I just have seen like what's happening with these other women, mm -hmm. you know, and that's because nothing's happening. <laughs> like even today, I saw this morning on the news that Trump like literally endorsed this guy. Bear in mind, Jamie is participating in a scheme to purposefully discredit alleged sexual abuse victims on behalf of Donald Trump's political movement. Following the Project Veritas script, Jamie repeatedly voices anxiety to try and coax Stephanie into saying something comforting to her, which James O'Keefe can then use to frame the Washington Post as having an agenda against Roy Moore. My whole thing is like, I want, I want him to be completely taken out of the race. <laughs> And I really expected that that was going to happen, mm -hmm. and now it's not. I don't know what you, yeah. what you think about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, like I said, that you know, the, the starting point really is to hear your story. So, so maybe you know, if we could just he would just kind of like at first just kind of like be really affectionate towards me and things like that. Uh huh. So, and it just kind of like went on from there. But I mean, like, I'm just not really comfortable getting into all the details. Really. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because you know? I still just don't know if I want to even do the story. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So I just feel like these other women are just like being discredited. Mm-hmm. It feels like people aren't believing them and mm-hmm. all that stuff. And I just don't want to go through that. Well, um, you know, what I can tell you is that, you know, one uh thing that we always do as a starting point, um, you know, and any, any good reporter would do this, um, it's just a you know, standard operating procedure, is that we, um, we like to, you know, basically know who we're talking to and, mm-hmm. you know, and document that. Yeah. And so, um, so kind of that, you know, there are different ways to do it. Um, and one, one of the kind of easiest ways to do it is just to see something like a driver's license. Do you happen to have an yeah. ID like that? Yeah, I do. Okay. Uh, Jamie hands over her driving license for Stephanie to check, and it confirms that her real name is Jamie Phillips, matching the GoFundMe page which the Washington Post uncovered. The audio you're about to hear is Stephanie pulling a printout of the GoFundMe page from her folder and putting it on the table to show Jamie. You know, as as part of you know, also sort of our research process, and uh, you know, we have, as as Beth explained, we have a. Um, you know, process of, of doing background, you know, checking backgrounds yeah. and this kind of thing. And so, um, so I wanted to ask you about one thing. And um, so we're so we're just doing sort of a background check, and um, and we came across this. Uh, this is a GoFundMe um, page, yeah. Um, which which has your name on it. Jamie Phillips. Yeah. And uh, and it has also, let's see, where was that? It lists um, somewhere, a, a donation from the person that you said was your child, mm-hmm. Taylor. Um, and it says that, uh, that you're moving to New York um, and that you've accepted a job to work in the conservative media movement to combat the lies and deceit of the liberal MSM. I'll be using my skills as a researcher and fact checker to help our movement. This is the point where two other journalists from the Washington Post position themselves at a nearby table in the cafe with a hidden camera. And so we see video kick in. So I just wanted to ask you if you could um, explain this. And I also wanted to let you know, Jamie, um, that this is being uh, recorded and video recorded. Okay. Um, yeah, I was looking to take a job last summer mm-hmm. in New York, but it fell through. So mm-hmm. I ended up not taking the job. Okay. So, but you were interested in doing this job. Can you talk about that a little bit? And- yeah, it was going to be with um, the Daily Caller. And what was your interest in working for the Daily Caller? Um, I just, I like the, I like their stories. Uh-huh. And I thought that I would be good at doing research and stuff like that. And uh, and so who was the person that you interviewed with? It was a lady named Kathy. What was her last name? Johnson. Kathy Johnson. But I don't know like why we are going into all this yet. Well, I haven't even agreed to go through with the story yet. You can just imagine what must be going through Jamie's head at this moment. She's lied to a national newspaper that a state senator sexually abused her and impregnated her as a child. Also, James O'Keefe can pull a trick on the Washington Post. She's probably thinking, have I committed a crime? Can I be sent to jail for this? Oh my God. Do you still have an interest in, as this says, combating the lies and deceit of the liberal MSM? Is that no. is that still your interest? No, not really. Yeah. Not at this point. No. no. I don't really want to get into any more details about my life because, uh-huh. I mean, it's like obvious that you're like not believing me, so I don't really see the point of uh-huh. even continuing the meeting, Yeah, you know, so I probably should just like cancel the whole thing. Okay, well, if there's anything, you know, if there's anything you want to say for the record, um, you know, we're, like I said, we're planning to write a story. Um, your name will be, you know, probably could be in the story. 
Um, and I mean, I don't, so if you want to explain, this is your chance to explain. Story. Well, um, we're all on the record, you know, as I said, and, I and this is, and this is really you, well. um, but this is your chance now, if you want to really explain this, I mean it. I mean, I, 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 mm -hmm. so, I mean, I haven't agreed to go on the record at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. When the tables are turned on Jamie, she withdraws from being a bullish negotiator, threatening Stephanie that she's going to retract her story unless she gets the sound bites she needs. And she transforms into this wilting flower, desperately trying to get herself off the hook for the lies she's told. To me, there's something deeply shameful about the way that when we get to this moment where Jamie has been found out, she appeals to the sanctity of the off-the-record agreement she made with Stephanie. If Jamie hadn't been found out, she would have taken the footage from this meeting and used it to literally destroy Stephanie's career. She wouldn't have thought twice about doing that. That was her plan. And yet now that the spotlight is on her, it's the relationship of trust that she tries to cling to. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? James has all these ways of rationalizing what his Project Veritas reporters do and yet when those reporters receive the same treatment from others that they dish out all the time look how mortified they are now this encounter is informative in many ways but there's one thing in particular i want to laser focus in on james has a boilerplate argument which he always trots out to justify his journalistic methods and it goes like this project veritas deceives people in order to have an honest conversation with them and make them reveal their true selves you have to use deception to a degree either you deceive your source or you deceive your audience so our undercovers draw people out by by uh, i guess figuring out what they need being that thing right and then and then having an honest conversation. It's not like I'm injecting my narrative or opinion in these videos. We're just showing people what people say when no one's looking. James's argument is that the situation is manufactured, but the words spoken by the target are 100% authentic, straight from the person's brain. They're things the target would be saying every day, but James's reporters are just there in the room to catch them saying it. But looking at the way Jamie conducts the Washington Posting, something she's clearly been prepped for by James, it's obvious that when James constructs this argument to justify Project Veritas's methods, he's not being honest. Jamie says she needs the reporters to verbally guarantee her that Roy Moore will go down. She says she needs the reporters to describe the impact her story will have. She needs reassurances that Donald Trump will be hurt by this. What we're witnessing here is Jamie following a script to put very specific words in the reporters' mouths. Say Roy Moore will go down or I walk away. Say that my story will impact the Senate race or I walk away. If the reporters had at any point placated Jamie by saying these words, James O'Keefe would have triumphantly pumped out the footage saying, look, they have an agenda to take Roy Moore down. They have an agenda to influence the Senate race. Here they are saying it. And James O'Keefe is himself engineering these conversations specifically to plant these quotes. Quotes which aren't representative of what the reporters would usually be saying to sexual abuse victims if they were left to their own devices. It's not like I'm injecting my narrative or opinion in these videos. We're just showing people what people say when no one's looking. It's more reality. It's people in their own words. I can't, I can't, I, I'm not a ventriloquist. This vaccine, we are in stage three clinical trials. Normally, stage three clinical trials is where you gather your data. What the responsibility on everyone is, is to gather that data and report it. And if we're not gathering that data and reporting it, then how are we going to say that this is safe and approved for use? How come after 18 months we I mean, So, I mean, you, you gather data in all parts of trial. I, I don't understand what she means by that. Um, like, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't even know how to, to verify that, right? So phase three clinical trials are about the safety and effectiveness, I think, of new treatments. And then stage two trials, I think, are to determine if the, um, the treatment actually works for a particular thing. Um, I can look up like stage, what are stage one? Um, I mean, we can look up um, what are different stage trials. Um, phase three was done in November. Yeah, I, that was just how she phrased that is weird. That like, oh, stage three is when we gather the data. Like, okay.
So phase zero is testing a low dose of the treatment to check if it's harmful. Um, stage one is finding out about side effects and what happens to the treatment of the body. Stage two is finding out about more side effects and looking at how well the treatment works. Stage three is comparing the new treatment to the standard treatment. And then stage four is finding out about long-term benefits and side effects. But, okay. We haven't had any it's, research. Isn't that fishy to you? It doesn't. It does. It, it is fishy. It's super it, fishy. It's not that it hasn't been done. It hasn't been published. <laughs> That's it wrong. hasn't probably uh, been done because the, the government doesn't want to show that the darn vaccine is full of, is full of shit. Is this, like the, is this the fourth time we've heard this clip or fifth time we've heard this? What does she mean by full of shit? It's not doing what it, its purpose was. And what, did, what is Dr. McGee saying in that video? He's trying to defend the vaccine. Why would he do that? Because that's his view on it. Okay. His view is get the vaccine, it's science, right? If we all just get it, this will all be over with. Such a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> And what do we do? I don't know, but there's so much I'm gonna blow up. So much? How yeah. do we do that? But like, you know, Project Veritas. <laughs> well, why are you choosing to? <laughs> what? What are these recordings? Deep throat. Like, what the fuck is this? Blow the whistle. It's not what a lot of people would do. They're scared, they're afraid. What prompted me to do this was when I was house supervisor one night and one of my co-workers had taken the vaccine and she didn't want to. She had went throughout this entire pandemic working in the- Why do we have to edit this like that? Can she really not make it through a, a sentence in an interview? Like this is YouTube. You should be able to reshoot it if you need to. Well, I, I, hate, I hate how they edit the fuck out of everything. Had taken the vaccine and she didn't want to. She had went throughout this entire pandemic working in the intensive care unit. It pretty much was a COVID unit. Yeah, it's really sad. She had just come back from surgery from leave two weeks ago, a little over two weeks, and then um, got her first dose of vaccine after surviving this entire pandemic. <laughs> what? Why didn't we get to see her chart? What is the implication that she died from the vaccine? What the fuck? <laughs> she didn't want to take it. She didn't want to take it because of her religious beliefs. And she was coerced into taking it. What? I want to know what religion these people are. Let's get a little bit more specific. If we're going to cite a religious exemption, like we need to be exempted from everything else the public is doing, I think I'm gonna, I want to hear what it is. Let's be more specific. And it's like, nobody, nobody should have to decide between their livelihood being a part of the team in the hospital or take the vaccine. Now, now, now we're just making people take it. And then there's- Yeah, I wanna know what that nurse died from. She said she just came back from fucking surgery. And you think it was a vaccine that killed her? Reactions to it. And then you have a medication that has been shown effective and surely has no adverse reactions for trying it. Did, um, Dr. Bob Wait, oh no. <laughs> are, we about to, are we about to take an ivermectin turn? Is it happening already? I want to talk to you about prescribing Oh no, it is. Not a lot of this control. And so physicians can't um, prescribe off-label use medication here? Not for COVID. They did it with hydroxychloroquine and they, it was really bad. And so they are not allowing it right now. She said, yes, um, I would agree to write for this because she's not contraindicated. And Dr. Bagwa said that? Yes. I am, I am stuck. I am told you are absolutely not to use it under any circumstances whatsoever for somebody with COVID unless you don't want to have a job. I am not going to lose my job. Damn. They were not allowing, they were going to lose their job if they allowed you to use that drug. Right. Nuts. Right now, I'm, what is plaguing <laughs> this country is the spirit of fear. Are you afraid? It's my career, you know, it's how I help people. Um, but am I afraid? I wouldn't necessarily say I'm afraid. 
um, because my faith lies in God and not me. And the $400,000 I raised on GoFundMe. And so I have um, two older kids that are on their own and I have a 12 year old at home um, that I care for on my own. You know, like what kind of person would I be if I, if I knew all of this? This is evil. This is evil at the, the highest level. You have the FDA, you have the CDC, that are both supposed to be protecting us, but they are under the government. And everything that we've done so far is unscientific. Are you afraid they're gonna retaliate against you? Yeah. I'm a federal employee. What other federal employees do you see coming out? But you put your faith in God. Amen. How Deception Propaganda, a new book by James O'Keefe. Reorder now at a Okay, well. I, I, don't, I don't know what else to say. Why would they release the chart of the one kid and then lie in the next breath and say, well, that person was healthy? When we can see in their chart that they're not. Why would you say that? Why would you lie about that? At least, like, don't show the chart. Read the comments? Oh, God. I can only fucking imagine. Prayers for James O'Keefe, Project Veritas, and the whistleblower. She is a hero for coming forward. If you can't answer, if you can't question the science, it's not science, it's propaganda. The protector, the protected need to be protected from the unprotected by forcing the unprotected to use the protection that didn't protect, okay. This is why so many nurses are leaving the hospital profession. They are being tormented and can't believe or handle the way their patients are being treated. It's against their ethical commitment not to do the best for their patients and families. This woman is a patriot and needs to be protected at all costs. Oh my God.